Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for February 5th through 11th, 2024. This is covering 2 Nephi chapters 1 and 2. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Yay, scriptures! Hello and greetings! And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 19 minutes, 11 seconds. Wow, that's not long at all. What would that be daily? 2 minutes, 44 seconds. Okay, come on. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and let's talk about them all together. Let's take an introduction from the 2017 Seminary Manual. It says... Nephi began writing the account that became 2nd Nephi in approximately 570 B.C., which was about 30 years after he and his family left Jerusalem. He wrote it when he was in the land of Nephi. Nephi wrote with three audiences in mind, his father's descendants, the Lord's covenant people in the last days, and all the people in the world. The book of 2 Nephi was written on the small plates of Nephi, which were designated by the Lord to be a record of the ministry and the prophecies of Nephi and his descendants. On these plates, Nephi recorded the things of his soul and many of the scriptures which were engraven upon the plates of brass. He explained that he wrote for the learning and the profit of his children. He declared, We talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies, that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. He concluded his record by inviting all people to hearken unto his words and believe in Christ. So let's start with 2 Nephi chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And now it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had made an end of teaching my brethren, our father, Lehi, also spake many things unto them, and rehearsed unto them how great things the Lord had done for them in bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem. And he spake unto them concerning their rebellions upon the waters, and the mercies of God in sparing their lives, that they were not swallowed up in the sea. And he also spake unto them concerning the land of promise, which they had obtained, how merciful the Lord had been in warning us that we should flee out of the land of Jerusalem. For behold, said he, I have seen a vision in which I know that Jerusalem is destroyed. And had we remained in Jerusalem, we should also have perished. But, said he, notwithstanding our afflictions, We have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands, a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for the inheritance of my seed. Yea, the Lord hath covenanted this land unto me and to my children forever, and also all those who should be let out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. It is so important to remember what the Lord has done for us and to see His hand in protecting and prospering us, especially during afflictions. It is also important that we recognize the consequences for our actions. Let's look for some of those while we continue Lehi's remembrances. Going on with verse 6. Wherefore I, Lehi, prophesy according to the workings of the Spirit which is in me that there shall none come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring. And if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. If so, it shall be because of iniquity. For if iniquity shall abound, Cursed shall be the land for their sakes, but unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. For behold, many nations would overrun the land, that there would be no place for an inheritance. Wherefore I, Lehi, have obtained a promise, that inasmuch as those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem shall keep his commandments, They shall prosper upon the face of this land, 
and they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves. And if it so be that they shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of this land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor to take away the land of their inheritance, and they shall dwell safely forever. So if Lehi's descendants keep the commandments of God, they shall be blessed in this land. They will be protected and prosperous. But notice that Lehi refers to those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem. That was interestingly specific. Because there is another group who is either here in the land or about to arrive just to the north of where Lehi is now. And they too were brought by the hand of the Lord from Jerusalem. In the Book of Mormon, we won't meet them for another 450 years or so, or until we get to the Book of Omni. So you can look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to the chapter, verse 10. But behold, when the time cometh that they shall dwindle in unbelief, after they have received so great blessings from the hand of the Lord, having a knowledge of the creation of the earth, and all men, knowing the great and marvelous work of the Lord from the creation of the world, having power given them to do all things by faith, having all the commandments from the beginning, and having been brought by his infinite goodness into this precious land of promise, behold, I say, if the day shall come, that they will reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, their Redeemer and their God, behold, the judgments of him that is just shall rest upon them. Yea, he will bring other nations unto them, and he will give unto them power, and he will take away from them the lands of their possessions, and he will cause them to be scattered and smitten. Yea, as one generation passeth to another, there shall be bloodsheds and great visitations among them. Wherefore, my sons, I would that ye would remember, yea, I would that ye would hearken unto my words. So there is another action Lehi's descendants could take. If they reject Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel, who has brought them to this land and blessed them, the judgments of God will come upon them and they will have their land taken away and be scattered and smitten. Let's go on with verse 13. Oh, that ye would awake, awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, that they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe. Awake, and arise from the dust, and hear the words of a trembling parent whose limbs ye must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave from whence no traveler can return. A few more days, and I go the way of all the earth. If we skip ahead to verse 21, it says, And now that my soul might have joy in you, and that my heart might leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow to the grave, arise from the dust, my sons, and be men, and be determined in one mind and in one heart, united in all things, that ye may not come down into captivity, that ye may not be cursed with a sore cursing, and also that ye may not incur the displeasure of a just God upon you, unto the destruction, yea, the eternal destruction, of both soul and body. Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness, shake off the chains with which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity, and arise from the dust. So what do you think it means to be spiritually in a deep sleep, to be bound with chains? What does it mean to be in the dust? That imagery reminds me of the natural man. We must arise out of those tendencies of selfishness and ego and pride and become a Zion people with one mind and heart with each other and with Christ. From the October 2006 General Conference, we have this great quote from Elder D. Todd Christofferson. He says, quote, By age, Laman and Lemuel were men. But in terms of character and spiritual maturity, they were still as children. They murmured and complained if asked to do anything hard. They didn't accept anyone's authority to correct them. 
They didn't value spiritual things. They easily resorted to violence, and they were good at playing the victim. We see some of the same attitudes today. Some act as if a man's highest goal should be his own pleasure. Permissive social mores have let men off the hook, as it were, so that many think it acceptable to father children out of wedlock and to cohabit rather than marry. Dodging commitments is considered smart, but sacrificing for the good of others, naive. For some, a life of work and achievement is optional. We who hold the priesthood of God cannot afford to drift. We have work to do. We must arise from the dust of self-indulgence and be men. It is a wonderful aspiration for a boy to become a man, strong and capable, someone who can build and create things, run things, someone who makes a difference in the world. It is a wonderful aspiration for those of us who are older to make the vision of true manhood a reality in our lives and be models for those who look to us for an example. End quote. Wow, that's an inspiring message. And taken with Lehi's, oh, what a great message, especially for sons. In verses 16 through 23, Lehi continued to express his great desire for Laman and Lemuel to keep the commandments and experience God's love. But he worried that the Lord's judgments would come upon them. Let's take a look at verse 24. Rebel no more against your brother, whose views have been glorious, and who hath kept the commandments from the time that we left Jerusalem, and who hath been an instrument in the hands of God in bringing us forth into the land of promise. For were it not for him, we must have perished with hunger in the wilderness. Nevertheless, ye sought to take away his life. Yea, and he hath suffered much sorrow because of you. So Nephi will be the next leader after Lehi dies. Look for the additional qualities Nephi has that make him a great leader as we go on. Verse 25, And I exceedingly fear and tremble because of you, lest he shall suffer again. For behold, ye have accused him that he sought power and authority over you. But I know that he hath not sought for power nor authority over you, but he hath sought the glory of God and your own eternal welfare. And ye have murmured because he hath been plain unto you. Ye say that he hath used sharpness. Ye say that he hath been angry with you. But behold, his sharpness was the sharpness of the power of the word of God, which was in him. And that which he call anger was the truth according to that which is in God, which he could not restrain, manifesting boldly concerning your iniquities. And it must needs be that the power of God must be with him, even unto his commanding you that ye must obey. But behold, it was not he, but it was the Spirit of the Lord which was in him, which opened his mouth to utterance, that he could not shut it. And now my son Laman, and also Lemuel, and Sam, and also my sons who are the sons of Ishmael, behold, if ye will hearken unto the voice of Nephi, ye shall not perish. And if ye will hearken unto him, I leave unto you a blessing, yea, even my first blessing. How would you like to follow a leader like that? As you look at those verses, which qualities mean the most to you in a leader? Let's keep going now in verse 30. And now, Zoram, I speak unto you. Behold, thou art the servant of Laban. Nevertheless, thou hast been brought out of the land of Jerusalem. And I know that thou art a true friend unto my son Nephi forever. Wherefore, because thou hast been faithful, thy seed shall be blessed with his seed that they dwell in prosperity long upon the face of this land. And nothing, save it shall be iniquity among them, shall harm or disturb their prosperity upon the face of this land forever. Wherefore, if ye shall keep the commandments of the Lord, the Lord hath consecrated this land for the security of thy seed with the seed of my son. The 2017 Seminary Manual includes this great quote from Elder M. Russell Ballard, this comes from the October 2015 General Conference. He says, quote, 
The Lord's servants are inspired to help us avoid obstacles that are spiritually life-threatening and to help us pass safely through mortality to our final, ultimate, heavenly destination. End quote. Amen to that. That's certainly what Lehi has been doing. Right. And that brings us to 2 Nephi chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. And now, Jacob, I speak unto you. Thou art my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness. And behold, in thy childhood thou hast suffered afflictions and much sorrow because of the rudeness of thy brethren. Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. Wherefore thy soul shall be blessed, and thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi, and thy days shall be spent in the service of thy God. Wherefore I know that thou art redeemed, because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer. For thou hast beheld that in the fullness of time he cometh to bring salvation unto men. And that is such an important principle. The Lord can consecrate our afflictions for our gain. The word consecrate means to dedicate or to make holy. That's according to the Guide to the Scriptures under Consecrate or Law of Consecration. The Lord can make holy your afflictions in order to bless you. Have any of you had that experience? The Institute Manual includes this great quote from Elder Richard G. Scott. This comes from the October 1995 General Conference. He says, quote, Just when all seems to be going right, Challenges often come in multiple doses applied simultaneously. When those trials are not consequences of your disobedience, they are evidence that the Lord feels you are prepared to grow more. He therefore gives you experiences that stimulate growth, understanding, and compassion, which polish you for your everlasting benefit. To get you from where you are to where He wants you to be, requires a lot of stretching, and that generally entails discomfort and pain. End quote. Now, afflictions can come from our bad choices, or some of our afflictions, like Jacob's, come from other people's poor choices. However, many afflictions are the result of life and mortality. We trace that back to the fall of Adam and Eve. The phrase, the fall, refers to the conditions and consequences of mortality that came to Adam and Eve and their descendants because of Adam and Eve's choice to partake of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. We'll be talking more about that later in the chapter, but first, let's hear about agency. Right, and for that, let's take a look at verse 5. And men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, and the law is given unto men. And by the law, no flesh is justified, or by the law, men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law, they were cut off. And also by the spiritual law, they perish from that which is good and become miserable forever. Now, this verse introduces some key elements that are required for moral agency to exist. First, there must be laws that can be obeyed. We must know those laws There must be opposition in order to have a true choice, and there must be consequences. There is a lot packed into that one verse. But how can everyone be sufficiently instructed to know good from evil? Not everyone has had access to the scriptures or prophets. At the end of the Book of Mormon, Moroni recorded these words from his father Mormon. This is Moroni 7 verse 16. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man, that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good, and to persuade to believe in Christ, is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with a perfect knowledge, it is of God. Here Mormon is referring to the light of Christ. In the Gospel Topics and Questions section of your Gospel Library under Light of Christ, it says, The light of Christ is the divine energy, power, or influence that proceeds from God through Christ and gives life and light to all things. The light of Christ influences people for good and prepares them to receive the Holy Ghost. One manifestation of the light of Christ is what we call 
a conscience. That's great stuff. In verses 6 through 10, Lehi goes on to teach Jacob about the redemption that comes through the Holy Messiah, that through him we can be saved. It's important for Lehi to make sure we know who and by what means our agency can lead to redemption. Let's take a look at 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 11. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must be a compound in one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense nor insensibility. Notice the examples Lehi gives of opposites. We may say, we don't want misery in this life, but then there is no holiness. We may wish for no wickedness, but then there could be no righteousness. Opposites are essential. The Institute Manual contains this quote from President Boyd K. Packer. This is from the April 2004 General Conference. He says, quote, Life will not be free from challenges, some of them bitter and hard to bear. We may wish to be spared all the trials of life, but that would be contrary to the great plan of happiness. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. This testing is the source of our strength. Close quote. Let's go on with verse 12. Wherefore it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. Wherefore this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes, and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. Let's skip to verse 15. And to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, After he had created our first parents, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and in fine all things which are created, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself, Wherefore, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. We've talked about this notion before, but it is a profound truth that faith is a choice. In order to make a choice, we need opposites to be enticed by. So there must always be a compelling reason to believe and a compelling reason not to. Then we choose. The 2017 Seminary Manual includes this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, again from his book, Christ and the New Covenant. He says, quote, God's premortal children could not become like him and enjoy his breadth of blessings unless they obtained both a physical body and temporal experience in an arena where both good and evil were present. We wanted the chance to become like our heavenly parents, to face suffering and overcome it to endure sorrow and still live rejoicingly, to confront good and evil and be strong enough to choose the good. Close quote. But we must have laws to choose from, and they must have consequences. Let's take a look at verse 13. And if ye shall say, There is no law, ye shall also say, There is no sin. If ye shall say there is no sin, ye shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. And if these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not, neither the earth. For there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. So now, Lehi will demonstrate the use of these principles with our first parents, Adam and Eve. Let's pick it up now in verse 19. And after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden to till the earth. And they have brought forth children, yea, even the family of all the earth. 
And the days of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God, that they might repent while in the flesh. Wherefore their state became a state of probation, and their time was lengthened according to the commandments which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. For he gave commandment that all men must repent. For he showed unto all men that they were lost because of the transgression of their parents. And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever, and had no end, and they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good for they knew no sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Okay, so let's summarize the consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve as described in these verses. Starting with verse 19, Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And also in 19, Adam and Eve had to till the earth and work for their food. In verses 20 and 23, Adam and Eve were able to have children. And in verse 21, all mankind are temporarily lost or separated from God, which we call spiritual death. In verse 22, Adam and Eve would experience physical death. And then in verse 23, we learn that they were able to experience joy and to experience misery. They were able to do good and they received a knowledge of sin. From the 2017 Seminary Manual, we have this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. This comes from a very memorable talk in the April 2015 General Conference. The manual first provides a summary by saying, While rock climbing without any safety gear in southern Utah, two brothers encountered a protruding ledge that kept them from reaching the top of a canyon wall. They could not get over it, nor could they safely climb back down. The older brother was able to boost the younger brother up and over the ledge to safety, but he knew he could not reach the ledge himself without jumping. He also knew he faced the risk of falling to his death if he tried to jump. Since he did not want his younger brother to see him fall and die, he told his brother to go look for a tree branch. The older brother then leapt as high as he could and grabbed the ledge. but. Unable to hold on to it, he started slipping toward his death. Quote, but then, suddenly, like a lightning strike in a summer storm, two hands shot out from somewhere above the edge of the cliff, grabbing my wrists with a strength and determination that belied their size. My faithful little brother had not gone looking for any fictitious tree branch, Guessing exactly what I was planning to do, he had never moved an inch. He had simply waited, silently, almost breathlessly, knowing full well I would be foolish enough to try to make that jump. When I did, he grabbed me, held me, and refused to let me fall. Those strong brotherly arms saved my life that day as I dangled helplessly, above what would surely have been certain death. Because we were then born into that fallen world that resulted from Adam and Eve's transgression, and because we too would transgress the laws of God, we also were sentenced to the same penalties that Adam and Eve faced. What a plight! The entire human race in freefall, every man, woman, and child in it physically tumbling toward permanent death, spiritually plunging toward eternal anguish. Is that what life was meant to be? Is this the grand finale of the human experience? The answer to those questions is an unequivocal and eternal no. With prophets ancient and modern, I testify that all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. It was part of his divine plan which provided for a Savior, the very Son of God himself. End quote. Wow, that's such a good analogy. Mm-hmm. Let's keep going in verse 25, one of my favorites. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. 
And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Now, in the April 2023 General Conference, Elder Craig C. Christensen had this to say, quote, We were created to have joy. It is our intended destiny as children of a loving Heavenly Father. He wants to share His joy with us. The prophet Lehi taught that God's plan for each of us is that we might have joy. Because we live in a fallen world, enduring joy or everlasting joy often seems beyond our reach. Yet, in the very next verse, Lehi continues by explaining that the Messiah came to redeem us from the fall. Redemption by and through the Savior Jesus Christ makes joy possible. Close quote. So we are free to act for ourselves and not to be acted upon. So then, what will we choose? Let's go on with verse 27. Wherefore men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. The seminary manual includes this quote from Elder D. Todd Christofferson. This comes from an Enzyme article in June 2009 called Moral Agency. He says, quote, Satan promotes conduct and choices that limit our freedom to choose by replacing the influence of the Holy Spirit with his own domination. Yielding to his temptations leads to a narrower and narrower range of choices until none remains, and to addictions that leave us powerless to resist. Using our agency to choose God's will, and not slackening even when the going gets hard, will not make us God's puppet, it will make us like him. God gave us agency, and Jesus showed us how to use it so that we could eventually learn what they know, do what they do, and become what they are." End quote. Oh, I love that explanation. So we are free to choose liberty and eternal life through Jesus Christ, or to choose captivity and death. When we first started our Scripture Gems series, I shared that one of my favorite scriptures was a verse when Moses, like Lehi, had laid out for his people the blessings of righteousness and the cursings of wickedness, one leading to life and the other leading to death, just like Lehi did. Moses' pleading in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 was for his people to choose life. life. And that is a very common theme in the Book of Mormon. You might hear us say this again. <laughs> Indeed. Let's take a look at verse 28 now. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator, and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit, and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh, and the evil which is therein, which giveth the spirit of the devil power to captivate, to bring you down to hell, that he may reign over you in his own kingdom." Now, we skipped this verse earlier, but it might be a great verse to end on. When Lehi is testifying about the redeeming atonement of the Holy Messiah, he says this. This is 2 Nephi chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of God of the holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God, inasmuch as he shall make intercession for all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved." Eternal life was what Lehi chose, 
And with that, he ends his words to his son Jacob. Wow. Such a beautiful chapter. One of the great explanations about the fall and how that fits into the atonement. There is so much packed into those first two chapters. I hope you took some time to study them and to pick out things that stood out to you. And as you discover these gems, either ones you've discovered in the past or ones brand new as you've studied this time, make sure to share them with family and friends. And don't forget to share them with us in the comments section of the video. We love that. So that's all the time that we have today. But keep reading your scriptures and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. 